And welcome back to the Greg Horrenda Show, where we are honored and thrilled to have David Allen Wright, number five, Captain America, one of the great all-time Major League Baseball players and New York Mets. David, welcome to the Greg Horrenda Show. Thanks for having me. What an honor. <laughs> um, I, do you mean that? I don't know if you mean that or not, but it's. It, I'm going to take that and make sure that our fans see that forever because the honor is all ours, David. I mean, and I know you hear this all the time, uh, but what you meant to the New York Mets and what you mean to the New York Mets and the fans. And I was born in 1961 uh, and I was there for the first World Series game. And uh, when I was in the backyard, we used to play the Meet the Mets song. And I used to take the subway to see the Mets. And for you to represent the Mets the way you did, man, I'm, I just have to, first of all, thank you, congratulate you, and, and just let you know that You've touched so many, you know, people from Norfolk to Flushing to Jersey to New York and to all the Met fans all across the world. I appreciate that. That's the biggest compliment I think that 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 I can receive. And I think that my dad would be proud, my mother would be proud uh, because they've always said that, you know, they set out to hopefully raise a good person, a good citizen, not so much a baseball player. And they made that very <laughs> evident in our in our youth when we were kids that, that we were good people before we were, uh, you know, athletes and, and we were good students before we were athletes. So I, I appreciate that. That's such a compliment. David, the Greg Horrenda show, and I know you did some research on me, I'm sure, but it's, it's about how you became who you are. And we've had some great guests and you're at the top of the list, but I love your family. I, I haven't met them, but your dad, it's just like my family, like old school discipline. I love that he didn't let you play the infield until you proved it uh, to, to him and your teammates in Little League and um, your grandmother basically making a locker room in your, in your, in your crib uh, with a bat. I mean, it's just, it's, it's American pie, but it's real. Tell me about your dad, your mom, your grandma, and, and, and just how hard you had to work around the house and how punctual and how disciplined you were that it enabled you to become, you know, who you've become. Well, thank you. Yeah. I mean, I think that my upbringing um, laid the foundation, I would like to think, for, um, you know, hopefully the little bit of success that I had on the baseball field, but more importantly, <laughs> the the type of husband I am, the type of father I am. Yes. Um, you know, I think that at the time, you know, my father was a disciplinarian, as you said, he was a police officer. Uh, my mother worked in the school system. So first and foremost, grades were number one. Uh, well, I guess number one, both were grades and, and being a good person. Uh, sure. you know, and, and, you know, there were times where I was upset where I slammed the door because I was five minutes late and I got grounded for being late. You know, but now I understand how important being punctual is. Now I understand how important it is when I'm raising a family of my own that I set those standards and set those boundaries and lay that foundation at such a young age because, yeah. um, you know, I think that instilled a, a tremendous work ethic in me. And that's because of my parents and my family. I, I mean, I can't, you look like you're in better shape now than you played for the Mets. I can't imagine. I don't, know how, I don't know how to take that. How do I take that? Are you saying I was out of shape when I played? Oh, no, you were always in good shape. But you're thin. <laughs> you were a heavy set yep. kid. And I remember we had, I don't know if you, I don't know, you probably played with him, Chris Young. Of course. The, the Chris, I recruited Chris. He was a great basketball player, Indiana, Princeton. And I was at Yale, recruited him. Chris was a heavy set um, boy. I just can't imagine you being like heavy, dude. What, what was like, were you just eating? I know you'd had like three meals a day at the, it was probably your, your, your diet at the Little League's uh, food stand. How, how were you heavy? So here's what it was, is I got three younger brothers. So, okay. and you know, we, we grew up a fairly blue collar family. 
So when my mom ordered pizza and there was one pizza between the four of us, it was, it was who could get the, the, the slices first, you know, like it was who could grab it first and get it down quickest. And to this day I eat fast. And I think that's because of, it. Uh, you know, I'm obviously yeah, joking, yeah. but um, funny Chris Young story. And we still keep in touch. He's a great friend is yep. he wanted to play basketball so bad. Cause he, all I heard about how great of a basketball player, Chris oh, Young yep. was. And um, me and Mike Pelfrey, one of our former pitchers, wanted, uh, to, I know. Yeah, Pelfrey, sure. wanted to take on Chris Young and our bullpen catcher on a two-on-two. -two. And we never got around to it, obviously, because <laughs> nobody wanted to get hurt. Bad, now, that, now, that I'm, now that I'm all broken and Chris Young's retired <laughs> and working in the commissioner's office, maybe we can get that game uh, up and running now. I got it. You got to help me get Chris on the show. He'll remember me. I was in his home with John Stuper. I don't know if you remember. John Stuper was a pitcher for the St. Louis Cardinals. Mm -hmm. He was the uh, baseball coach at Yale, and I was the assistant basketball coach. Chris was from, you know, a beautiful home in uh, Dallas, Texas, Texas, and uh, oh, that's very cool. David, he wasn't smart enough to get into Yale. That's why I went to. <laughs> well, that's what it was. I told him at the end, we didn't, you couldn't get in. You're not the best and the brightest, and he went to Princeton. And, but you know what? I got to give him props. He could play, David. He could play. Yeah. Okay. You just played baseball, man. So were you like, I, I said to my son, who's a huge Met fan as well, what should I ask? And he goes, I don't know, Dad. You just do your best. And I said, I got to ask him about his hoop game. Like, did, did, what was your game? Give me give me your, your hoop game growing up. Did you have any? Okay, I got one quick story. I was more of like the uh, like the defensive, like scrappy, like yeah. I try to box out the big guy, you know, like that kind of player, <laughs> the, hustle, the hustle type player. So I think we get along well. Yeah. But um, – I played basketball my freshman year in high school. Okay. And I think one of our first games, we were playing a private school. I went to public school, playing sure. a private school. And on a fast break, it was, I was playing defense and I took a charge and he stepped on my foot as I was taking the charge and snapped my ankle. And that, wow. ended, that ended my uh, high school yeah, basketball career. career. Cause wow. I, was supposed to, I was supposed to go to actually a baseball tournament uh that weekend we were playing during the week and i was supposed to go to a baseball tournament that weekend and i laid in the tub like almost crying because i wasn't going to be able to go play in this baseball tournament baseball. Basically. i messed my mess my ankle yeah, up yeah no that, i think that was a smart move on your part yeah. to, to uh because now kids just play and you were ahead of your time now kids are just solely focused you know on one sport and you play only one sport and um you doing that was a good it was a very good decision man this is a question I ask a lot of my guests, David. When did you, when was the first time that you realized that you can be a professional baseball player? Like, did you imagine it when you were young and you know, you said, I can do this, or was it, you know, you committed to Georgia Tech and then instead of going to Tech, you went with the Mets? Like, when was that moment when you said, I got this, I know I could, I can be great, and I can be a major league baseball player? You know, that's a good question. I, I would say, <laughs> this is going to sound funny, but I would say I gained a ton of confidence. I played, I started the 2004 season in double A. Yep. And I got off to an incredible start in Binghamton, New York. And I was always told that double A is where all the top prospects, where the, the, the future major league all-stars, that's right. where you develop. And when I got off to that kind of start, I started getting this, this inner confidence that like I can hang with the yes. best minor leaguers in the game. But yes. I, didn't, I didn't realize that I could make an impact on the major league level, I don't think, until after my second season in the big leagues. I, I played about half a year in 04. Yep. I played a full season in 05. And, you know, I, was, I always told myself, and maybe this was a way of, um, you know, always pumping myself up or always motivating right. myself is, okay, I, I played – well for a half a year in the big leagues in 2004. Anybody can do it for a half a year. Now let's see when pitchers start adjusting to me in 05, if I can do it again, if I can be the type of player that I was in right. And after that, you know, after that sophomore slump, after I got through that, you know, I kind of realized that, okay, you know, I'm gonna cement myself. I'm gonna anchor myself at third base for the New York Mets for the, for the next decade, hopefully plus, and I'm gonna be the guy and I'm gonna prove everybody that I'm the guy here. I, I, I love that, David. Your first home run, how vividly do you remember it? Who was it against? What was the score? Give me your first home run. Montreal. So, uh, you know, it was, it was 
incredible. My first game was at home. So I, uh, our AAA manager, John Stearns, uh, uh, was, our, was our AAA manager. Tough in North guy, Carolina. man, John yeah. Stearns. That, bad dude. That's, that was his, uh, you know, it was yep. funny. John Stearns used to tell us in AAA that if we had a winning streak, I think, of four games, he'd allow us to watch his highlight tape from playing college football. That was, that was the John Stearns quote, that he would allow us to watch his highlight reel playing college football if we had a four-game winning streak. <laughs> Sternsy, Sternsy called me in the office and I got called up. Um, I was on the first flight, a uh, little propeller plane from Norfolk, Virginia to LaGuardia at yeah. like 8, 8 a.m. The next day I was in the lineup against the Expos. Uh, I went hitless. Um, I got my first major league hit the next night. Yeah. Uh, um, and then our first road trip was to Montreal and I hit my first homer, uh, you know, in Montreal, there was nobody in the stands. There was one guy like in left center that actually like reached out. It made a great play on my home run. Yeah. And I think, uh, the clubhouse, uh, Charlie Sam was the clubhouse guy. I went and got him and we traded like a bat and a Jersey for the ball. Oh, that's cool. I still have that ball, but you still cool. have that ball. Of course. Of course. I, you know what? Just those moments, I think to me, because guys like us just to run out onto the field, man. And just like, forget about it. You're a, a future hall of famer, seven time all-star two-time gold glove. I don't even know what a silver slugger is, but you got two at all. <laughs> You're in a 30-30 club. But to me, if I ever had it, I, I would just want to run out and just shag fly. Like, you know what I mean? Like, do you, you seem like, obviously, the guy that really values everything that you've received. But, like, just tell our audience how blessed you've been just to play that game for so many years in front of people in stadiums and in arenas and in world series, just try to give the normal Joe, the Tommy Parker, that my boy from Tom's river that watches every single one of your games, no matter what to tell us what that feels like. I would say that I was lucky enough to, I believe been born with, a lot of talent, some God-given talent. Um, I'd also like to think that part of the equation was the work ethic that we talked about earlier. Yes. Um, when I took the field, I was six foot, about 205 pounds when I played. And so, you know, by no means was I the fastest, strongest, biggest guy out there. But when I took the field every day, um, before I took the field, I crouched down, I kind of put my head, you know, down. And I told myself that I'm going to be the best player on this field tonight. And it's not because I was the most talented or the most gifted. It was because I thought I worked the hardest. So whether I was playing yes. cross town against Derek Jeter, whether I was playing in San Fran against Barry Bonds or whether I was right. facing Mariano, it didn't matter. You know, I outworked whoever I, I told myself, I outworked whoever I was playing that night. And that yeah. night I was going to be the best player on the field. So I think it was a combination of, you know, God-given skill, uh, work ethic, and also, yes. also a bit of luck because, you know, had I been a shortstop in the New York Yankees system coming up, there was a guy named Derek Jeter oh, there playing and probably right. would have never made it there. So, you know, yep. I was lucky to, to be drafted by this organization, groomed by Howard Johnson and Ken Oberfell and Tim Tuffle, yeah. um, you know, some of the best to do it. So, you know, I was put in a great position to succeed. I had great coaching uh, in a, like I said, a, a tremendous situation. So very, very lucky. David, tell me when you say you're the hardest working, give give us a glimpse behind the scenes. I know how hard you worked at the end of your career just to get on the field. I mean, spinal stenosis puts people, you know, down and you continue to fight. And, and, and that's one of the reasons why we all admire you so much. But prior to your injuries, what were you doing that? Uh, led you to believe that you were the hardest working player on that field that night? You know, I think it was just, I remember my first off season coming home, playing minor league baseball. I, I come home. I was still living at home with my parents. Uh, I was 18 years old. So I come home from the season and, you know, I was a college age kid. So right. I slept until like probably 11 o'clock, <laughs> you know, and I remember my dad coming in, you know, after you got off work, it was like, what'd you do today? I was like, oh, nothing kind of slept in, probably played some yeah. video games, you know, nothing much. And he's like, well, you need to go start working out and start hitting me. I said, well, the guys, you know, tell me you should take some time off before you get going again for next season. 
he goes, you need to start treating this. This isn't, this isn't a hobby anymore. You know, this right. is a job and you need to start treating it like a job and you might not be able to, you know, physically put in eight hours a day, but you need sure. to start into a routine where you work out, you hit, you throw, you take grounders on a consistent daily basis because you need to start treating this like a profession because they're paying you good money to do this That's instead right. of, instead of a hobby. You know, you're not paying to play anymore. They're yeah, paying man. you. So you better, you better so live be, up the end of it. So before you met Sam Levinson, your father was the Sam Levinson. Is that his? I mean, you had some like, some really great upbringing. I mean, this doesn't happen by, I mean, you would, like you said it, you have talent, you were blessed with a lot, but I mean, it's just great because our, our, our players listen to the Greg Horrenda show and our fans do, but just the, there's no substitute for work, man. But you, but your father sounds like um, I could, I should hire him and put him on my staff. Is that? Uh... <laughs> well, he's a little bored. He's retired these days. So he might be looking for a gig, but uh, you know what? And I was lucky you mentioned Sam and obviously Brad plays, um, you know, but yeah. I was lucky to get in with those guys early, Sam and, and Seth Levinson and, and Keith Miller and Peter Petalino. You know, I was lucky that I felt like, and I maybe got this from my father being a police officer and my mother. Right. Like I always tried to surround myself with good people and the right yeah. people that were going to keep me on track to being successful. And I was lucky enough to, to surround myself with people. And some of my closest friends to this day are childhood friends because that, you know, right. that trust doesn't go away. You know, that, that circle does not go away. So, uh, you know, so I think I've, I surrounded myself with people that had similar goals that did not allow me to get off track. And um, I think that's part of the reason for, for the success as well. David, I have two questions. One, one is I'll give you the, the easy one for not the easy one. I'll give you the, the f more, uh, the, f the one that will, you'll enjoy the most first, your favorite memory or memories of being a Met. And it could be, get into the world series or it could be a road trip with uh howard johnson or it could be anything jay horowitz bugging you to do an interview or give me give me what, what were your greatest memories of, of of being in new york man all right so you 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 named three people so I'll, I'll give you a great memory my greatest memory by far this is a layup is playing yeah. in the world series in 2015 that's you know every player's goal i grew up hitting into a fishnet my dad made this, uh, this tea and put fishnet between two trees in my backyard. And it was always like, you know, you're playing for the Mets world series, you know, David Wright's up to bat whack home run. And to be able right. to live out that dream, that's, that's number one by far, but Hojo, uh, great story. He was my double a hitting coach and it was freezing in upstate New York. And we had, uh, these little heaters in the, in the dugout. And I think we had a rain delay or something. And he was always mischievous. Like it was, Hojo was like a little kid. So he's yeah. like, he's like, D right, come here. And I think we were the only <laughs> thing the dugout. He's like, crank that heater up as hard as it'll go. And it was like, uh, it's got the, 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 the gas, you know, the, 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 what the, the kerosene or kerosene, yeah. the kerosene. Yeah. So we take it and he's like, watch this. This is a trick I learned. So we, we took a broken bat that somebody had broken and we put the bat in and caught it on fire in the kerosene. We started spraying like this spray on it to make like a blowtorch in the dugout. <laughs> I remember that's, I mean, I got so many Hojo stories, but that's one that, that is we, funny. We, did, we did tarp slides during the rain. In that's right. Saint yeah. Saint Louis and, Saint Lucy. <laughs> uh, and then Jay Horowitz. Jay, Jay is, is just the best. I mean, yes. I, I, I mean, it. if there was a Mount Rushmore, although he didn't play, if there was a Mount Rushmore of Mets, you know, yep. he'd be on that for how much he, he loves this organization and cares for this organization. But Jay, uh -huh. I learned it from Johnny Franco, used to play these practical jokes on Jay. Sure. And see, Johnny was a little bit, you know, more hardcore than me. Johnny would like snip his Brooklyn. tie. Yeah, oh, yeah. So Johnny would snip his tie and do, you know, like hide, you know, ketchup in his bed to think he was bleeding and stuff, you know, right. stuff like that. You know, but I always, I, he, Jay, towards the end of his, his PR career with the Mets, you know, yeah. couldn't, see, couldn't see all that great. So he's sitting up at the press box and he has binoculars. So I would go and put eye black around the ring of his binoculars so after the games, he would look like a raccoon when he came into the club. I had to be careful because if we lost a tough game, I'd have to get to Jay before he get in the clubhouse and make him wash it off. But if, we, but if we won, he would go into the press conference with the manager, you know, with these big black rings around his eyes. And 
uh, you know, that but Jay, is funny, man. Jay, Jay's the best. And that's the difference. Like I grew, I think the reason I became a Met fan is everyone in my neighborhood loved the Yankees because, you know, you, they have 27 world championships, but the Yankees to me are a great organization. Don't get me wrong, but they don't have as much fun as Met people do. You know what I'm saying? Like there's no question. And I know like John Sterling's a good friend of mine. And, but like, I grew up with Bob Murphy, uh-huh. Lindsey Nelson, Ralph Kiner. You watched the Kiner's Corners, like Ralph Kiner was drunk every Kiner's <laughs> Corner. Like, it was the greatest. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's, I mean, I, I would agree with that. I think that, um, you know, I, I don't know what it is like to play with, with the Yankees, but I do yeah. know that it seems like, um, you know, we're, we're, we're blue collar. I believe New York right. you know, underneath is a, is a blue collar. Uh, met town and yep. excited, you know, w- when we did have success, you know, yep. Queens, oh. that city lit up blue and orange. Big no time. Problem. Give me, give me your biggest regret, toughest moment as a Met, um, other than your personal, your injury, mm-hmm. just as a, as a teammate or as a, you know, what do you regret that, uh, you know, obviously you wanted to win, the, you know, you played in two World Series, David? One, played in one World Series. We get, we got, and you you led me into my regret is okay. 2007, um, you know, we had an epic collapse. We were up seven games with 17 to play and got uh, tracked down by the Phillies the last game of the season. Oh, to, God, yep. Uh, and that that's my biggest regret because we had – the firepower. We had a good team in 2006. We were a couple of runs away from going to the world series. Um, you know, 2007, uh, we had a great team and we just epically collapsed with with seven minutes to go. We just got cold at the wrong time, hot at the right time. And, um, right. That was kind of the downfall of that era for us where, you know, everything was building up, you know, 2005, oh, exactly. 2005, we became a better team. 2006, we're a couple runs from going to the World Series. 2007, we're heading on that trajectory. Then all of a right. sudden, we fall apart. 2008, we do something similar, although it's very different circumstances where right. you know, I just don't think we had the firepower of some sure. of the teams that we were chasing. Um, and then comes like a rebuild in, in 09 and all the way, you know, up until, you know, we start having some success with the Jacob DeGroms and the Noah Syndergaards and the Steve sure. Jackson's and the Matt Harveys. Um, you yeah. know, so I would say by far my biggest regret is I wish I could have done more um, in, in 2007 to, to get us over right. back in the playoffs. When, when like, and I'm a college basketball coach and this is my 36th year or 37th year coaching, believe it or not, David, okay? <laughs> That was you, look, you look you look great that was a joke yeah. <laughs> and there's some moments and i don't know when they come but they come you know maybe when you're flying through philly or and they just sting you you know like the loss that you know we lost to fordham in the first ever patriot league championship game to go to the tournament when i was at holy cross and all of a sudden those moments are just, and you try to hide them, I guess, you know, but it's like going to the dentist. And when you hit that nerve, man, it's, do you hit the, you're not one of these guys that dwell on, you had such a great career. You don't dwell on, you know, the one or two moments where you didn't succeed or does that still stay with you and bother you? Yeah. I, I, and I'm not sure if this is mentally healthy, but I will say that, um, I hated losing more than I, I enjoyed winning. No question. So the moments that I failed always kind of stuck out and gave me extra motivation. That's why you were great, man. When I succeeded, I expected to succeed. You know, I didn't want to celebrate something that I expected to do. Yeah. But when I failed, you know, that was a shock to the system because I, I wanted to succeed so bad. Tell me about your book, The Captain. Now, do you have a copy under the tree there that you can show her? <laughs> no, are you kidding me? If I tried to give a copy of my book to my wife for Christmas, she may divorce me. <laughs> so, <laughs> now, that, now was, whose idea was that? Was it Sam's or yours? Or how did that come about? 
it was actually I never I never even thought about it to be honest with you. And the, right. uh, the co-author Anthony DiComo works for MLB.com approached me uh, shortly after my playing career was done and said I want to write a book and I kind of laughed. I was like, you got to be joking, you know? He's like, no, serious, you know, I I, I want to dig in deep. And I said, you know, I don't think I'm interested. And he goes, okay, well, I'm going to write it on my own. And, um, you know, he goes, there's really three options. Either I write it on my own. You know, I try to, you know, find what your childhood was like, this and that. He goes, you give me a little bit of time. It helps me out a little bit. He goes, or we do this, what I think you'd want it done the right way. Right. And, you know, you come in with me and it's going to be a lot of your time. Um, you know, but I think it, it turned out the way that you want it to turn out. And, you know, it intrigued me that I got three young kids you know, none of which are going to remember me playing baseball. So, you know, that was in the back of my mind where if I can hand this to them one day, sure. and, you know, not necessarily like, Hey, you had, you didn't have this dorky dad that you think you have, you know, <laughs> but, you know, but, but the life lesson in it through baseball yeah. is that, you know, set your goals high and try to accomplish them and don't let anything stand in your way. And I think that's the message I tried to portray through the book, right. but we live some of those memories. And as you know, you know, you don't, you don't ever sit there and pat yourself on the back for a, you know, a great win or, you know, our great, no, no. But you're in the moment, you're looking forward to that next challenge. So right. reminiscing about these great stories, you know, put a big smile on my face and then get a chance to go through. I, I asked my parents back home in Virginia, you know, they're kind of pack rats. They keep everything. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Hey, I got to pick out some pictures for the middle of the book, some family pictures. Can you send me some like, oh go, my God, go through, pick out about a hundred or so. And then I'll narrow it down from there. Well, a week later, I get like four huge FedEx boxes at my door. That's got thousands of pictures. That's not you know, so, so going through that and my grandparents have since passed, but um, you know, going through that and reminiscing family photos and, uh, you know, reliving my childhood was, was really special. And I got a lot out of it. Well, David, man, uh, baseball's got nine innings. Basketball's got a clock and, and we're hitting the clock. I just can't, I, I can't thank you enough for your time. Everything that you've done. Uh, Sam told me that you were going to be an incredible guest and, and you're just a, you're a good dude. Last quick question. Yeah, Why no Virginia accent, man? You got a, straight up American, like there's no y'alls and what, what's up with that, man? What was your, well, I do come from Southeast Virginia and I may have had it before New York, but yeah. I can't, I can't, you know, being in New York for as long as I have, I think it maybe maybe neutralized it a little bit. Well, you're in the category. We just lost the great Tom Seaver. Um, and which was very difficult for you and everybody, but you're in his class now, David, and the carry the torch and, we got a new owner. We'll be back. And uh, and you're a fairly Dickinson fan. I'm going to send you and your family some gear. And uh, I just can't appreciate your time enough, man. You're the best. Please send me some gear. I will rep it out here in Southern California. And hopefully we could do this in person the next time. Amen. I got you. David, thank you so much. Thanks a lot.